All right, so the challenges of crypto and Bitcoin, Ethereum continue. We're going to break down a lot of stuff for you guys today to really take a look at what the future might hold for investing in crypto right here in the shores of the great USA. We'll dive into all that. Of course, if you guys are international, you'll get a chance to see a lot of other aspects that could spawn some pretty major growth in some emerging countries and areas, regions of the uh, world around blockchain and Web3. My name is Paul Barron. Welcome back into Tech Path. Uh, let's get into it. And uh, part of the, the show today, we'll break down a little bit about Bitcoin. We'll give you guys a little bit toward the end. Uh, but there's a lot here around regulatory, but also understanding where the innovation opportunities might be. That's the bigger picture that you need to pay attention to. I want to thank our sponsor, and that is Bitcoin uh, 2023. If you're going to be here in Miami, make sure and get to this conference. It's a big one. Uh, pretty much the biggest conference, I would say, of the year around crypto, primarily focused on Bitcoin. So there will be a lot of Bitcoiners there and uh, people that are really kind of focused in on Bitcoin. However, with that being said, there also are other aspects around the crypto universe that will be done there at the event. Cool thing is you can use our code down below and you're going to get a 10% discount on your tickets. It's a little bit of a pricey ticket, so it's worth the money. Uh, use the code down below and uh, it does help the channel out. Let me know if you're coming too. Just drop in uh, comments or hit me on uh, Twitter, uh, at Paul Barron, because maybe we'll meet up. All right, I want to get to this statement right here from Chamath Palihapitiya. And this is, and I'll, I'll, I'll respond to it because I know a lot of people are, it's been going around for a little bit on uh, Twitter. But you can hear it right here. It's dead in America. Crypto's dead in America. I mean, now you had Gensler, over. you had Gensler even blaming the banking crisis on crypto. So they've, the the United States authorities have firmly pointed their guns at crypto. Hmm. Is, is it a scapegoat or was it a fuck around, find out moment for crypto in your mind or a little bit of both? I, I don't know. I just think that they were probably the ones that were the most threatening to the establishment. OK. And they were right there. All right. So that's pretty much it. Most threatening to the establishment uh, in regards to the monetization or the monetary system. And one of the things I would say around Chamath is, while I respect him and what he's done at Facebook, a lot of his investments, is I look at sometimes his, um, his opinions to be a bit contrarian in the sense of where the global use of, of um, technology might truly become powerful. And it's not that I'm right, he's wrong. It's not that at all. I just look at it from a different standpoint. I'll walk through this in a little bit to give you guys kind of some, uh, you know, some hope here, I think, for what will happen in the United States. And mainly because I've had a chance to kind of live through that whole process before. You know, I went through, one, the antitrust lawsuits with Microsoft. I was employed there at the time. Uh, we had to deal with a massive shift in our own, you know, strategies around how we would address the internet and the birth of the internet and even the dot-bomb era where we saw massive growth and a and basically assimilation happen within DC. And I'll talk about that in a minute. There are some things though that are happening that I think are a little bit more critical uh, because here's the scenario. If you start to see some of your best minds, your best companies start to throw in the towel, that's a different consideration that could put some problems into the marketplace. I'll explain. Here's Coinbase continuing its overseas expansion amid U.S. regulatory pressure. Uh, and, and of course, it could, this could flow a couple of ways. Coinbase, second largest crypto exchange in the world, received its digital asset business license from Bermuda, the monetary authority. And Coinbase now will open an offshore derivatives exchange there as soon as next week. So they're going to be in the game now with a lot of the majors out there, including projects like and platforms like Bybit, OKX, MEXC, a lot of those that are going to really open up, I think, Coinbase's ability to do some things. The question is, them being a publicly traded company here in the United States, how does that translate maybe to value, but also what their strategies might be here for U.S. customers? Aside from the Bahamas, Coinbase also has expanded to Abu Dhabi, uh, Dubai, and then Canada, Brazil, and Singapore, all of which have been somewhat crypto-friendly regulatory environments. And even if you look at Canada, I mean, they've got you know publicly traded ETFs, You've got a lot more integrations over there. And then, of course, the recent news here last week that we reported on, which was the Mika ruling uh, legislation for the EU, massive in the way and opportunity for where crypto is going to be going globally. Remember, and even on our channel, you know, we are 40, 
5% or so the United States, granted that's the largest part of our channel, but 54% uh, are in 190 countries around the world. So this may be interesting to watch, especially around the idea of innovation and what that might look like going forward. And does the U.S. need to really be involved in this? Let me kind of paint the uh, potentials. Here was Rand from Crypto Banner with Raul Powell talking about this very issue. Let me play this clip. The, the, the business, the industry, the focal point uh, shifts to another, um, you know, shifts to London. It's possible. But can crypto succeed without U.S. participation? That's uh, it, it's not a lack of participation. It's the lack of industry being focused there. So if you think what happened to the derivative market, the euro dollar market, the FX market, everybody participates. But because of U.S. regulations, they don't do it in the U.S. So even U.S. pension funds had offices in London to be able to use certain elements. The hedge fund industry just went to London. U.S. retail investors will still get access to the market. You just can't build serious businesses there. So they just get built elsewhere, and that's fine. All right, so what Raul was talking about there is this whole idea of first movers. And this happens in so many tech industries. It's a normal scenario. In fact, most of the time, if it's a mature enough technology, first movers can be the ones who truly win. Now, it is tr if it's truly bleeding edge tech, first movers are usually the ones that lose. And I'll explain that in a minute. But the point being is that derivatives, the derivatives market, uh, the U.S. had regulatory pressures around derivatives trading and pretty much eliminated that market being birthed here in the United States and London became home, home base for derivatives trading. That, of course, later on made the, the U.S. look a little kind of out of sorts and eventually the U.S. got in the game. Problem. The major center for financial activity and derivatives, London. So that in itself, U.S. loses. And I think some of the lawmakers, a lot of uh, people have kind of had egg on their face uh, for this very scenario. And I think this is, might be playing out here right now with what's happening in the United States around uh, crypto in general. And back to the first mover concept. I mean, if you just think about social for a second and you look at early movers and we'll go back into just, let's just go back to MySpace. Um, but there were a couple before MySpace those were early movers. MySpace was still an early mover, bleeding edge mover, lost. The first mover, once it got to a point where there was enough market capacity, was Facebook. Facebook now, one of the top four companies uh, in the world, and they're the winner. This is what I'm getting at, is that we're looking at a potential shift in power of technological proportions that could really affect the future of the United States in a big way. And what's interesting to me is right now it is up for grabs. It could be the EU with Mika. It could be the Pacific Rim. It also could be the Middle East. There are so many areas here that potentially could play into this. We'll get into the BRICS nations and some of that stuff uh, also a little bit in, in this topic. But I think the opportunity here is going to be pretty significant. Here's another scenario right here. U.S. crypto firms eyeing overseas move amid regulatory uh, scenarios, and if you just look at this, this is Ripple, Brad Garlinghouse saying crypto industry has already started moving outside the U.S. Coinbase, largest base exchange, considering launching overseas trading a desk. Now we know, uh, driven by U.S. regulatory uncertainty. This to me should be absolutely terrifying to lawmakers. This is the most, and I think the worst potential opportunity for growth, potential opportunities for its citizens. And most of all, potential opportunity of moving forward in the world stage as we see technology leap to the next level. And here's something I want to think, I want you to think about. I want you to think about the integration of AI and what that's going to look like in the next five years. You add AI and blockchain together, two of the emerging technologies that are happening here in the world right now as we speak. And we have companies and countries that are starting to align in both of those sectors. It won't matter if we're the fastest pony in the race when there's these thoroughbreds that are racing by us because they're enabling another technology. You're kind of getting a double uh, in the essence of where that technology could go, meaning AI and blockchain integration in the future for decentralized everything and the aspect of tokenizing the world. This was something that uh, Yatsu and I had a conversation on 
on our show. Listen to what he had to say about this. That is very much an American slash Western narrative. Um, so for, to take a look, for instance, what's happening in Asia, but right? every major Korean game company, for instance, is all in on the metaverse. All right, moving. I mean, yeah. you know, yeah, and, and Japan as well. I mean, just, just to be clear, even the prime minister of Japan, Japan uh, Kishida, actually has made Web3 and the metaverse national agenda. Right? Uh, when you look at, for instance, Hong Kong, traditionally Hong Kong, people have looked at Hong Kong and said, oh, isn't that part of China? Aren't they sort of against crypto and so on? Well, Hong Kong just launched their first Bitcoin and Ethereum ETF uh, before the end of the year. Uh, right. And our financial secretary has just, re again, reinforced the statement that Hong Kong will be a virtual asset, digital assets hub and leader in the space. All right. So Hong Kong, virtual assets, digital hub and leader in the space. Hong Kong, China. You look at the potential of what the Pacific Rim formation might look like from Singapore to Korea, what we'll see within Malaysia in, in general, I think, uh, all the way into smaller countries around the region that could really play into the developer scope. And I'll get to that in a minute. But the point being is what Yasu said. And I think I would say that this is probably top three, top five minds in the Web3 space out there uh, in terms of what Animal Brands is doing and trying to do within this space. This opportunity is going to be real. And I think the problem that the United States now is facing is a Johnny Come Lately you know, scenario. And if it doesn't get its uh, act in order, it could be too late for the United States, which could open us up into some new parameters starting to play out into a social sphere that may change some dynamics on the global stage. That's for another show, but I'll, I'll talk about that uh, a little bit deeper. I want to jump over to a report here. And this was a report around the U.S. share of Web3 Dev. And I'm over here on slide 10. There's a lot here. Let me zoom up on this a little bit for you guys. Uh, this is the Web3 Dev ecosystem, all-time high, right? Let's play this out for a minute. Here's showing uh, developers that stay in Web3 even if the price is false. So this shows a lot of commitment to the space. No problem. Very good. The U.S. could capture the next 1 million Web3 developers. This is pretty significant because the birth of Silicon Valley was this right here. It is exactly what I'm pointing at right now. The birth of Silicon Valley, which gave birth to the biggest companies in tech, which make up the largest trading base in Wall Street. So you've got technology that will be impacted by where this may be going. Do we become a nation of gamers? a nation of consumers, and the real technology that's happening in medicine, real estate, finance, space travel, and everywhere else outside of what happened on SpaceX uh, over the past uh, weekend, is all of that maybe now at risk? And I think, I know it's a slippery slope, but that is kind of the scenario that we could be facing just in that point. Further into this deck is this right here. This is U.S. losing market share in Web3 development. This, this trend line right now, Tom Emmer, yeah, Tom Emmer needs to be uh, explained pretty significantly because this to me is huge. The U.S. is also down 29% in self-reported market share. That's a problem in the United States. And then here's U.S. Web3 dev growth slower than other countries. This is the worst thing that can be happening in the technology field if you are a country trying to reposition your monetary system and avoid de-dollarization. Worst thing. Because why? Technology is the driving force of the planet right now. It's not something you sidestep away from. Technology is going to solve all the problems on everything we've ever dealt with in terms of business. And AI coupled with this and what we'll see in blockchain is going to be pretty significant. Russia and India are growing and also taking market share. This is a problem. Now you've got your uh, neighbor, your neighbors all starting to wrap up here and start to understand, hey, we've got an opening here that the U.S. is set back on their heels. They're fat and happy. This is the perfect time to do an undercut. And this is a problem I think that we're going to be facing uh, for a short period of time here. Uh, Bybit, this is interesting. Bybit moves to impose mandatory KYC rules for all services. This means, guys, for you trading right now on Bybit, through a VPN, they're going to use uh, basically a baseline uh, technology that would basically block that for use of in the United States. This means that Bybit, two things can happen here. They will have to take that U.S. volume 
and retransplant that hopefully from others. That's going to have to be a market share. The problem is Coinbase is getting ready to go into this market, much like Gemini going to India, etc. There's going to be a lot more players vying for that global market. So Bybit, I think, might end up being a bad position here uh, overall. The other thing is, it's, you know, if you think about just in general, it's a bad position for the United States because we're going to start to see a lot of people that have the means to maybe start looking at other residency aspects. And I was talking to a friend and a pretty significant uh, attorney over the past few weeks. He was indicating that this is one of the biggest trends that they're starting to see is around 3,000 people. I can't remember if it was a week or per day that were filing to basically expatriate themselves. And that's a problem because now you're getting the best and most affluent moving to other jurisdictions to be able to apply, whether it's business, investing tactics, all those kind of things that play into this. So U.S. needs to get their act together. Then you have, of course, speaking of an act, is the Restrict Act. This was, uh, of course, just recently. I'm just going to highlight the co-sponsors of this. I'm going to zoom in on this a little bit so you can see this a little bit. These were the, uh, you can kind of see the red blue right there of the of the uh, lawmakers that were involved in this. There's Gillibrand. There's Collins, Heinrich, uh, Capito, Blumenthal. All these have been there, that Senator King. Uh, and then uh, Boozman also been involved in, um, in activity as well. And I want to play this clip so in case you're not completely aware what the Restrict Act is doing, but how this might also apply to more control of the society here in the United States. Listen in. We're going to protect you from China by spying on you. Let's try to get some answers out of the Senator Lindsey Graham, who supports this and is here now. You got to be kidding me, Senator. Did you read this? Yeah, I don't think I support the Restrict Act. <laughs> You don't support this because you were named as one of the supporters because this is garbage. Never thought in my career that I would ever say this, but you just watched one of Jesse Waters' best moments in calling Senator Lindsey Graham out over his support for legislation that's been dubbed as the Patriot Act 2.0, even though it's being passed off as simply a ban of TikTok. Now, uh, the Restrict Act, which is what Jesse Waters is talking about here, was absolutely supported by Lindsey Graham. In fact, he's a co-sponsor. Let's watch a little more of that interaction. Well, is this the one with John? There's two bills out there. One allows a review of businesses that, that are connected to China, give the secretary the ability to protect our data. Uh, is that the Restrict Act? We got S-686. Oh, right here, yeah. March 7th, mm -hmm. and we got a bunch of Republicans supporting it because this thing is crazy town. You don't want yeah. the government looking into your private phone. No, I don't. If and they, they have can. a hunch you're colluding with the <laughs> Russians, we remember how yeah, that turned that's out. That's right. Yeah, no. I want to stop it there because the, the fact that Graham, uh, a Republican, is so clueless on this First of all, that's the striking thing. Let's let's go back to the Restrict Act because the Restrict Act was a perfect uh, Trojan horse. Go after TikTok, bad China company, you know, influencing our kids, doing all these things. But let's bury in, like they always do. Uh, I was listening to Congressional Dish just the other day. If you guys don't listen to that podcast, you should check it out. They they break it down. She does a great job. And she broke down this whole act around what exactly was the real underlying. The underlying effect is simple, being able to spy on American citizens and get into your mobile devices and start to track any and everything you might be doing. That is the Restrict Act. And that is exactly how Jesse Waters, and I would have to agree with, uh, <laughs> with TYT, and that is that uh, he put him on the spot. And I think rightly so, because it shows you how clueless some of these lawmakers are in even what they're trying to propose. So what it does represent is a lot of opportunity for the next generation of lawmakers. Listen to me out there, you 30-somethings, you 40-somethings, who are maybe in Congress and in the House right now, and you're looking to start to really run. I think this is an opportunity for you to get a limelight and to position the United States in an entirely new way, as opposed to these curmudgeons that know nothing about where technology is going and why that that would be a bad thing anywhere, much less in the United States. So 
it's a pretty bad situation for this to kind of roll up in there. Here was Mario Noffel talking about the Restrict Act Data Act. These bills were produced under the guise of banning TikTok. Reality is a piece of legislating covert powers would be granted to the secrecy of commerce and president to spy on U.S. citizens. Absolutely uh, not a good deal. It begins by explaining the challenges of holdings, uh, you kind of get uh, control holding, the broad nature of the definition. Shocking to go into some of this. And then you kind of see of, of what that means. Bill can be used to force you to divest, divest, and or make you face criminal uh, and civil sanctions. How would this be indirect holding uh, be determined? This is how authoritarian powers take hold. People, this is the time in our life. If there was ever a time that you've been in business or you've been in, you know, in any kind of activity of investing or getting your position in the world, this is the time right now in which you need to really start letting your lawmakers know where you stand. These are the kind of things that they will take from you if you allow it. This is the problem that we're facing here in the United States. And I think the whole world is sitting back and just saying, let's let Rome burn. Let's just let it burn and see what the fallout might become. Because you're going to get the best, most talented technologist moving into other countries. You're going to get the most capital repositioned across the globe. You're going to get repatriation of some of the best up uprising talent. The only thing that would be unfortunately left in the United States is a consuming population that could be a problem going down the road. All right. More here. This was talking about um, ETH of security. I don't necessarily, I'm going to play this clip because I want you, I want to get you guys' opinion on this. If there's some attorneys out there, I'm going to ask Metal Lawman about this very statement, but listen to what he had to say with, on the Laura Shin. This is Jason Gottlieb. But ETH isn't a security. It's uh, <laughs> frankly pretty obvious to me. But even if it were, it's too late to do anything about it at this point, right? The SEC has statutes of limitations. Uh, ETH was first issued before five years ago. So there's really very little that uh, the SEC could do about that right now. All right. So I don't know if this is true. Um, and, and I'm not saying that ETH is a security. I'm just saying that the SEC still may have a case if there is one. Um, because of the merge and, and what we saw of a shift from proof of work to proof of stake, that may be considered a reissuance. I mean, with, the, with really the regulations being non-existent, I mean, it's very possible the gray areas could exist in that way. I'd love to uh, get, if Metal Lawman is listening in, uh, hit me up on uh, Twitter. I'd love to chat with you about this very topic because you being a securities attorney would understand this. Let's get into a couple more tweets here. Uh, this was Whale Chart talking about Argentina Central Bank has run out of U.S. dollars and now is using customer deposits. This is a central bank, people. A central bank doing this. You're, you're a U.S. citizen or maybe you're a French citizen and you live in Argentina for whatever reason and you have U.S. dollars in the bank. You think those are safe, right? The idea of a central bank seizing your assets out of your bank that are not Argentini, Ar Argentinian money but actual U.S. dollars, this is a march in the direction that we've talked about is happening. These are the kind of things of world monetary shifts that start to occur. And guess what? Bitcoin is sitting right there on the sidelines, ready to go in, ready to take control and get the ball. And I think that's what we could be facing. And again, you have the United States sitting over here on their hands and all this playing out. Uh, Credit Suisse, $69 billion in assets leave the bank first quarter of the year. Over six months, $225 billion in assets left the bank. Magnitude of losses and outflows. You can kind of see it. I don't think we have to point out too much there. It's pretty alarming. And then you uh, go into this one right here. Uh, 19 new countries submit membership requests to join BRICS. Come on, people. This is exactly the problem is it starts where you think there's no problem. There's nothing to see there. Nothing here. Nothing there. And now you have BRICS starting to evolve into 19 more countries rolling into these five. I mean, come on, this is, this is significant uh, of how this can move forward of resetting the world and global reserve. The U.S. dollar is at the center. The United States has a lot of homework ahead of it. Here was the, co I'll end on this, Cobalisi letter. Large investment banks have seen massive revenue declines this year, with the exception of the five, since 2022, down 19 and 26 for large uh, 2021, J JP Morgan even is down 54% with Goldman's revenue down 56. Wall Street is now feeling the pain 
of inflation and high rates. So all this plays into it, guys. This is a bigger narrative that we'll continue to report on for you and get you a lot more detail because this, this goes into so many you know, spider areas within not only technology, innovation, the monetary system, finance, and also investing. This starts to fold into one area, and that is a new global power starting to emerge. And it may be a group of countries, possibly the BRICS nations, that start to roll. I mean, if they grab in 19 more, and this is something I've said many times, remember the G20 was the global power 20. Could that start to separate to where we see a BRIC 25 that starts to reposition all of this? We'll dive into a lot of this and uh, more stuff. I am going to be uh, on the road a little bit today, so I'll be doing, or this week, I'll be doing a couple of remotes, but we will have all of our full show lineups. We'll be doing our all coin show on Wednesday. Uh, lots in, in store for you, so make sure and stick around for that. Let's take a look at the poll and see what they had to say. From your perspective, what region seems the most crypto-friendly? Asia, Europe, or the Middle East? Man, Middle East, Russia at 30% over Asia. Surprising, but obviously Europe at the top of the list right now with the Mika red, uh, regulation becoming a major scenario. And obviously NFTs are certain will also start to see their way into that regulation. So a big one. A couple of things I want to hit on on some questions. Here's Jeff Fries. Republicans or Dems, doesn't matter. Two wings, the same corrupt bird, for sure. We got a problem. Uh, no way, Grant. <laughs> yeah, he didn't read the bill, for sure. Uh, I'm watching Paul watch TYT. You got to love that, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I'm not, just by, by the way, guys, I'm not a, um, I don't know that I would call myself one way or the other, but, you know, I try to give both sides of the center, you know, even except when we get super right and super left. Anyway, crypto isn't leaving the same veiled uh, threat Microsoft and Amazon and Google have used to Trump. Uh, used to Trump. Yeah, I, I agree. That may be a possibility. It's a good strategy to really put force a little bit of pressure on to lawmakers because if they see money exiting, that's a problem. That affects PACs. Here's another one. I think China uh, doesn't care about crypto because they don't care about freedom. Uh, this is what they want you to think, I feel like. There's, a, there's something going on in China. I don't know what it is just yet. I have a person who lives there, a business individual in the investing community. I think it's time that I really get an understanding of what's happening inside, inside of China. I don't think Western countries uh, are clamping down on crypto. It's all scare tactics. You can still trade in crypto from Western countries. Uh, in China, you can't. And well, technically in China, you can because you're, if you're in Hong Kong, you can't. So you're in China. Um, I think if crypto uh, moves outside the U.S., banks will take over crypto trading. Yes, you are onto something right there, and that may be the big plan all, overall. It's something I've talked about often here. Uh, let's see. What else do we have? I don't think uh, Coinbase is going to leave the U.S. Still way too much profit for them. If there is profit, I mean, if they do get enough regulatory pressure, maybe there isn't as much profit. The fact that they're going to a derivatives trading house, I think, is pretty uh, significant for them. Uh, let's see here. This info, non-start if y'all don't use uh, centralized exchanges and self-custody. I totally agree. Center, I mean, you know, self-custody is great, but at some point you've got to get into liquidity and you're going to have to go to somewhere where you, unfortunately, will have to KYC. If there isn't a place to KYC, you just put yourself in a pretty bad scenario. So all this painting out, we'll be painting a lot more uh, going for, yeah, well, you know what, Crypto, Steve-O, we are going to do that. I'm going to get some free tickets from the guys over at the Bitcoin conference. And I'm going to try to get some for you guys. We'll give some away. Uh, I'm going to hit them up and uh, see if we can't get some free tickets for it because it's next month. We still got some time uh, and we're doing, you know, doing runs on their on their promos. Uh, all right, guys, make sure if you're not part of the Diamond Circle, that's where you're going to catch a lot of my additional content, a lot of my really inside takes. And I'm going to be doing an inside take on this one right here, which is an audio format that gets a little bit deeper on where all this is going. Uh, but I think I'd love to get your feedback. And the way to do that is jump, jump into the Diamond Circle. Click the link down below. By the way, we have a secret deal on our CPI and our mastermind groups. Go over to members deals on paulbearnetwork.com. You'll get a chance to see it. It's very limited time. Check it out. I'm not even going to say it, uh, but it's a cool deal you guys can't miss. If you want to catch me, it is out there on Twitter at Paul Barron. We'll catch you next time right here on TechBath.